This is Jamie Court. I'm with uh, Consumer Watchdog. I'm president of Consumer Watchdog, and we're here at Consumer Watchdog's offices in Carthay Circle in Los Angeles. And uh, we're here today because there is a public corruption scandal that has embroiled the city attorney's office and the DWP over billing issues and disclosure. And we've talked for weeks now about how Oops, let me get a mic issue going. Let's not even. Okay. All right. I'll, we'll try not to hit it here. I'll try not to. We've talked for weeks about how uh, City Attorney Mike Fuhrer and the City Attorney's Office had attorneys representing both the city as defense in a DWP misbilling case representing the DWP and attorneys working for the city also represented the plaintiff in that case, Antoine Jones, unbeknownst to anyone. This was done in order to give uh, a settlement that didn't really resolve the core billing issues, uh, uh, a quiet, uh, a quiet uh, burial. And as a result, the consumers in LA, millions of DWP ratepayers today still face big billing problems with their water and power bills, and we don't know why, and we don't have an end in sight. And that scandal has resulted in four uh, top attorneys being on the hot seat at the, uh, at the city attorney's office. Three of them have actually been fired or have resigned, depending upon how you want to look at it. We're going to talk a little bit about what's happened in that case in a minute and why Mike Fuhrer, the city attorney, needs to submit to an outside review and take more actions to fix this problem. But today we're here with another troubling, troubling example of the failure of the city attorney and the DWP to disclose to the ratepayers of this city the costs and the charges that they face. And um, we are here with uh, two members of the Consumer Watchdog staff who are uh, really important to this case. Um, they are uh, Carmen Balber, who is the ratepayer and the executive director of Consumer Watchdog, who, as you will see in this matter, uh, is the plaintiff in the objection to an LADWP settlement, and Ben Powell, who is the attorney representing Consumer Watchdog uh, and representing Carmen in this challenge. This is a case that has nothing to do with the hundreds, tens of millions of dollars that consumers have been misbilled. This is a case that has to do with a transfer of money that happens every year from the coffers of DWP to the coffers of the city, the general fund. And that is a transfer that should be disclosed to the public and also should not happen. In this case, Ben's going to talk about how a lawsuit settlement that basically purported to resolve this issue but allowed these transfers to continue misled the public. And the fact is the city attorney signed off on a notice that failed to disclose a quarter of a billion dollar transfer from DWP ratepayers to the city. He failed to, allow, to, to adequately tell the public of these costs. And he failed and he, he failed to live up to his responsibilities to the courts, we believe, which is why we're bringing this action, but also to the public to be truthful and honest about the costs that DWP ratepayers face so that when they get a settlement notice in this litigation, they would have an honest choice about whether to be part of the settlement or to object or to not be part of the settlement. Because the city attorney was not honest, and we warned him ahead of time, and DWP was not honest, ratepayers didn't have a chance to really understand that they were losing a quarter of a billion dollars a year and had nothing uh, that they really could do about it. So I'm going to let Ben talk to this failure to disclose where we are with this notice in the case. This is the notice that went out to consumers uh, that failed to mention the quarter of a uh, billion dollar transfer. And this is really fine print. We re rely on our city attorney and DWP to actually get that fine print right and not to try to bury 
the lead. And so D Ben is going to tell you what, where we are with this case, and Carmen's going to tell you why, as a ratepayer, she's offended by this practice. And then we'll talk uh, just generally about where we are with the entire DWP corruption scandal and what needs to happen next. Ben? Thanks, Jamie. Uh, so like you mentioned, my name is Ben Powell. I am a staff attorney with Consumer Watchdogs Litigation Project. Uh, so there's been a long history of voter outrage over municipalities and cities sort of using ratepayers as an ATM and taking ratepayer money and using it directly for city purposes. There have been multiple times over the years where California voters have actually passed ballot initiatives like Propositions 213, 218, and 26, for example, to stop these kinds of transfers. But invariably, the city attorney finds ways around them. The city council or maybe the mayor's office wants more money, so what do they do? They go ahead and raid the DWP's coffers for that money. So yesterday, Consumer Watchdog filed our final papers in court and the appeal of this class action settlement that Jamie mentioned, where the city attorney's office failed to disclose this quarter of a billion dollar transfer uh, to class members in that case. Um, so this is the notice that, the postcard notice that was actually sent out to class members, and it's not indicated in there. Um, even though this $242 million transfer was occurring, and it was not disclosed, the settlement still barred these class members' ability to challenge that, act uh, that, that transfer in court. Um, this settlement was about these very types of transfers, ones that start out as ratepayer funds, earmarked maybe for a specific purpose like infrastructure or keeping rates down, and they're transferred and co-opted for a completely different purpose. Here, that was being sent to the city's general funds for general purposes. And this money is desperately needed by the LA DWP for infrastructure repairs in these types of situations. You know, see the rolling blackouts that were planned last year because of the overload on the grid. And so these transfers are done even when the LA DWP desperately needs this money. And the connection here, and put everything in context, is that the city attorney represented the city and the LA DWP in this settlement action. And when notice was sent out to advise consumers about the settlement, they specifically did not mention this $242 million transfer. This is a significant due process violation because as a class member, when you receive notice, you're supposed to be told what you're giving up. And that wasn't done here. What people were left out of understanding was that if they didn't opt out of the settlement, they would not be able to challenge this in court. You're asked to either stay in and accept the benefits of the settlement or to opt out or object. And if you're not given the proper information, you can't make an informed decision to do that. This is a pretty basic concept in class actions where when you receive a notice, you're supposed to be able to have enough information to exercise your rights to be heard as a class member. And that didn't happen here either. The, strategic, the settlement was strategically designed by the parties in the city attorney's office so that any activity occurring after notice was sent out was not included. And it, all of that was released. And they didn't have the opportunity to actually challenge that transfer in court, even though they knew, the city attorney's office knew, that that transfer would be occurring just a couple of months later. They actually knew about it months in advance and signed off on it. But the MO just seems to be protecting this established system of using the LADWP as an ATM. If they were really operating as a city attorney, they should be ensuring that the LADWP is above board and is acting as a good actor. But instead, what they're doing is seem to be acting more like defense attorneys for, and defending these otherwise bad actors. These, these cases that come up where due process concerns are sort of center stage don't come up very often. So when they do, we like to take a stand on behalf of consumers. The trial court, unfortunately, in this case, did approve this settlement despite the problems with the notice and the fact that the city attorney hid this transfer from the court and from the class, so we objected with Carmen Bulber, our executive director, and the DWP rate pair to in uphold the basic rights of class members and the integrity of the class action system as a whole. Um, if pe people deserve the truth, consumers deserve the truth, and if they're not being given the truth in these types of major cases by the city attorney's office, then we can never expect them to be fully informed to make these informed decisions and they'll lose these rights to transfer these types of, to challenge these types of transfers in court. And we thought that was important enough to get involved in. Thanks. Herman, you want to talk a little bit about why you're the <coughs> uh, So my name is Carmen Balber. Um, as they've said, I'm the executive director of Consumer Watchdog and I'm a DWP rate payer. I pay my bill every month and as a rate payer, I expect the money that I send to LADWP to go to provide me electricity, water, and trash services. Now, I might think this bill is too high, but at least I think that when I pay the DWP, they're using that money to provide me electricity, 
to fix the water pipes that are spewing all over the city, to replace broken trash cans. What I don't expect is that a quarter of a billion dollars every year of my ratepayer money is being funneled to a secret slush fund at the city of Los Angeles to use for any purpose other than providing me electricity service. It's outrageous. Um, that's why, as a ratepayer and Consumer Watchdog's executive director, I am the plaintiff in this case because it's outrageous, number one, that this secret tax is hidden in our bills to begin with. It's doubly outrageous that when the ratepayers got together and sued the city over it, came to a settlement over these outrageous practices, city attorney Mike Fuhrer and the DWP again hid from the public another $242 million transfer. Uh, there is no way, as, a rate, as the executive director of a consumer organization, let alone as a ratepayer, I could have figured out from this notice that that $242 million transfer was about to happen because it is nowhere in that postcard. When ratepayers received that, they would never know and they lost their rights to object. Uh, that's why, as a ratepayer, I objected to this settlement. If, for example, uh, there's a class action lawsuit against Toyota for exploding airbags and the class settlement offers a $5 coupon to every consumer, consumers have a right to know that's coming so they can say, wait a second, that's not enough. That's not a fair settlement of this. I want to bring action on my own. That's exactly what happened in this DWP case. The city and DWP hid a quarter of a billion dollars that was being moved from my DWP bill and uh, in the city of Los Angeles to the city without disclosing it to the public, and that's outrageous. We deserve full information and the ability uh, to make an informed choice. That's why uh, we filed this uh, uh, objection to the settlement and are finalizing this appeal today. We'll turn it back over to Jamie to talk about the broader endemic problems of ethics violations at the city attorney's office. Well, this is uh, part of a, a much larger picture. Um, this is the billing cover up scheme bulletin board. And what you have to know is the reason we're not hearing the mayor or the city council condemn this DWP billing scandal, despite the fact that it involved a no-bid contract for $36 million to a company that operates out of a $3 million oceanfront condo and is named after a Lamborghini, Av Aventador Utilities. The reason we're not hearing more is because the DWP, every year, gives tribute to the city of about a quarter of a billion dollars from ratepayer funds, and it's blessed by Mike Fuhrer, the city attorney. In this case, it's not just blessed, it's hidden from ratepayers in the settlement that was supposed to stop this, but isn't going to stop these transfers. These transfers will go on. They may be less, but they will go on. That's why we're objecting. But Mr. Fuhrer is caught in the middle of the scandal, and let me explain what's recently happened. Of the Four attorneys involved in the city attorney scandal. The chief assistant city attorney, Tom Peters, resigned on Friday. Consumer Watchdog had called for the four top deputy, two top deputies and four special counsels to resign on March 6th because of this cover-up, because of this scandal. To date, three of these four deputies are gone. Paul Kiesel, Paul Paradis, Tom Peters. The top deputy, Jim Clark, should resign immediately. He knows, according to the deposition, that these city attorneys represented both the plaintiff and the defense, the DWP, and didn't tell the court, didn't tell the public, didn't tell the ratepayers. So Mr. Fuhrer needs to force Mr. Clark to do what the other attorneys have done and leave the city attorney's office, and frankly, Mr. Fuhrer needs to open himself to scrutiny by the attorney general and outside authority. He cannot be reviewing his own department, which he's doing right now. So these resignations are just part of a larger, larger shakeup that's needed at DWP. And uh, today, we're hoping that 
As the court goes forward, and the court has said there's a prima facie case of fraud against the public, against the court, that we're going to see Mr. Clark resign shortly as the top deputy. We're going to see Mr. Fuhrer agree to submit to an outside review beyond his office walls of this whole crisis. Uh, that's got to happen because what's at stake here is tens of millions of dollars in ratepayer money, uh, which, by the way, is nothing compared to the $240 million we're challenging in court. Um, so uh, we're hoping for some resolution. The city council, by the way, has asked for a report back about this $36 million no-bid contract, which was awarded to one of the city's attorneys, special counsel, who was also accused of representing both the plaintiff and the defense in this case. They brought in a guy from Ohio who made $15 million in legal fees and took the Fifth Amendment when asked if he gave these attorneys kickbacks or referral fees. One of them claimed they didn't. The other hasn't testified. This is, this is a corruption scandal worthy of a mafia sting operation, not the Department of Water and Power in the city attorney's office. I mean, we've got companies getting tens of millions of dollars from ratepayers in no-bid contracts named after Lamborghinis and operating out of Ocean Punk apartments. We've got attorneys taking the Fifth Amendment when they, when they say, what do we do with that money the court gave us? The judge, frankly, needs to refer these guys to the state bar, and he needs to tell Mr. Fuhrer that he needs to submit to some kind of outside review here. Um, it's unacceptable for ratepayers to lose this much money every year. I would say one other thing, just while we have folks here, um, to open it up to some questions in the line or the room, um, something separate and apart happened today that we should notify people about, and there's going to be a statement on our website. Is it up there already? It's on consumerwatchdog.org. 31 days ago, the insurance commissioner of California was petitioned by um, uh, 10 public interest and civil rights groups to begin a hearing and rulemaking process to stop the use of education and occupation and auto insurance. He's answered that petition and saying he is going to do hearings, but he is not going to submit to a timeline for rulemaking. This is an outrageous practice insurance companies in this state engage in. They today charge you based on your college education and based on your profession, and it's illegal. It's not a rating factor approved by voters. The commissioner has said he will look at this. He will hold hearings on it. He will see how this discriminates against people. He has not committed to a timeline or a rulemaking. Insurance Commissioner Ricardo Lara needs to commit to a timeline to deal with this very fundamental problem we face, which is right now 18 percent of Latinos have college degrees. The other 82 percent pay more for their auto insurance because insurers discriminate against them. 25 percent of African Americans have college degrees. The other 75 percent pay more for their auto insurance because they're discriminated against. Ricardo Lara needs to stand up for these people during the next year, year and a half. These hearings need to lead to rules. These rules need to have a timeline. This cannot be more talk with no action. And we are hoping the insurance commissioner is resolute in a process that moves forward to get an end to this discrimination. And we welcome participation in that process. We're glad that these hearings are happening. But we have to tell the insurance commissioner that they need to result in rules on a reasonable timeline because this discrimination has gone on too long. So just wanted to throw that in there for anyone listening who cares. Uh, it's a big deal in California, and it's a big deal for the people who voted Ricardo Lara, who was the first Latino insurance commissioner in the history of the state. He needs, and I know he does, take that very seriously. Any questions uh, from uh, in the room or the line? The participant lines are unmuted. Sorry, go ahead. Um, Regarding that surplus, yes. isn't there a, a state law or some kind of a law that a public utility is not allowed to profit on utility? They're not allowed to make a profit, and that's where that comes from, is essentially a profit? <coughs> the, uh, you know what I'm saying? there was yeah. a little bit to it. Um, so there are, there are a plethora of different laws and regulations and things about, according to the city charter or the uh, constitution, things like that where they can sort of get around any type of thing like that to say, you know, use it as a surplus, even though it may not actually be a surplus. It's just sort of a matter of funny accounting at this point, and that's sort of consistent with all the rest of the different things that we see going on. So it's year after 
year after year, wouldn't that be considered a profit? That they're, they're profiting from the We might be inclined to agree with you, but yeah. due, due to some different kind of legal gymnastics oh, and things okay. like that, they've been able to sort of kind of circumvent all of those type, type, different types of regulations successfully for years. Right. With the help of the city attorney's office, right. I would add, I mean, the city attorney should be representing the public and the consumers, not just DWP in these cases. And this surplus, I think we're looking, what was it, $8 billion at one point that they had built up a surplus of? $8 billion? Uh, you know, that has been used there to be a piggy bank for the city of L.A. until voters said, that's illegal. Then they settle another class action, frankly, for very little money. I mean, if this is the notice that went out to ratepayers. Look at this. $52 million will be given back to ratepayers. The settlement fund, $52 million. And we'll limit how much we transfer each year to 8% of the surplus. $52 million is nothing when you consider what's missing in this notice is the $215 million. If you had said the settlement is currently estimated to be $52 million, by the way, the city is going to get another $250 million of your money in December, people might be a little annoyed, which is why it's not in the notice. That's why hiding the ball and the facts from the public result in these crazily undervalued settlements where the plaintiff's lawyers get paid and the city attorney gets to smile at DWP and everyone else and the city fathers don't come down on the, on, on the city attorney's office when he's embroiled in this crazy DWP billing scandal. This is a cozy relationship between the city council, the mayor, the DWP, and the city attorney's office at the expense of the people of Los Angeles. And you know why it happens? Because there's one party rule in this city. And I'm a Democrat, but these are all Democrats protecting everybody else's butt. And the attorney general needs to come in, but he's also a Democrat, and look at this and report back to the public because this is way too cozy. When most people hear the term billing scandal, the excuse was, I believe, when I heard, oh, it was a software problem uh, and you know, yeah. it, was a, it was a vendor's software that messed everything up. A lot of people, do you think, dismiss it when they hear that? They think, oh, yeah, that was a software issue, but they fixed it. Well, that's a, that's a great point, and that's what this chart actually shows is that there were two lawsuits. There's the ratepayer lawsuit against DWP for just overbilling, okay, because it's partly bureaucracy, it's partly people, it's partly computer. Then the city instead wanted to sue PricewaterhouseCooper, the consultant to the software maker, to say it's their fault. It's the software consultant's fault. We had the wrong software. So when there was legitimate cases filed against DWP by ratepayers, what happened was the city got very nervous and they recruited their own plaintiff, a guy named Antoine Jones, who literally four months after the first case filed his own case against DWP over the same issue. Now, these attorneys who represented the plaintiff while they were representing the city defendant, the DWP, basically said, we can't be caught doing that. We're going to find another guy this guy from Ohio, Jack Lanscoder, to represent Antoine Jones in a new case. So we don't have to settle with these original ratepayers. If we settle with these original ratepayers, we might actually have to do discovery and confess our sins and fire some people. But instead, they set, they, they, this guy filed the case in April 1, four months after the original cases, then offered settlement the next day. They settled quickly because they control both sides of the case. Then they went to sue the software maker. Because they said it's all the software consultant, the software maker's problem, not, not our problem. Well, that all got tied up in a nice bow until when the software maker started to defend the case, he found out that the two city attorneys had recruited the plaintiff in the case, and they did something called a reverse auction. They found a lawyer who would settle against the city cheap, quickly, without discovery, and without any mess, so they could sue someone else and collect their money. They got caught red-handed, and you know what? Outside of depositions and under oath where they did tell the truth and they said they were all in on it, Mike Fuhrer has yet to say he's sorry, he knew about it, and it's wrong. If he did that, and it'll never happen again, we'd have a better result here. So go ahead, Jack. Sorry. Yeah, I, I'm wondering, do the ratepayers have a case against Mike Fuhrer in the city attorney's office for poor representation? I mean, it seems to me, well, first of, first of all, I think Fuhrer should resign. But secondly, do we have, do we, the ratepayers, have a case against the city for crappy representation? Um, fortunately, since I'm not a lawyer, I don't know, but it's something that's, that's, that's worth looking into. He represented the city department 
And the rate payers theoretically had their own representation, but the, the, I guess there is a question a, as to whether he abused his authority or trust. It's very hard to sue city entities. It's called sovereign immunity. Right. So, uh, lift, like so it's a big lift, and that's my non-lawyer, <laughs> lawyerly answer to that question. Anybody on the line have a question? No? Anybody left in the room? But I did hear Jack Humphreyville saying uh, uh, that uh, Mike Fuhrer should resign, which which is probably less of a question than a commentary. True. Now, the, the other question I have is, where is the board of, board of commissioners in this whole thing? You know, they are appointed by Garcetti. Right. you got Mel Levine, who's a, obviously a very well-respected lawyer. Right. Uh, you know, they, they're MIA. Well, and I will tell you, Mel Levine is part of this problem. Uh, he's very close with Paul Kiesel. He's very close with Paul Paradis, the two special counsel who resigned. Uh, I don't know where he stands with anyone else, but this is a cozy club. And what's really interesting about what we're talking about today, although a little complicated, is this transfer that we we're, we're suing over. This transfer right here is how it is the lubrication for that cozy club. Um, you know, a $250 million annual transfer from DWP to the city sure makes it, you know, feel like no one really wants to ask too many questions because the city does have a lot of essential services that should be funded. That's true. It just shouldn't be funded with ratepayer money in this surreptitious way. And so, uh, you know, I, I, think that, uh, I think that part of the problem is that we do have a DWP commission and, and Mel Levine that rubber stamp what DWP general manager wants to do. The classic case is this no-bid contract uh, that we talked about where when uh, Aventador Utilities wanted a $36 million no-bid contract, they went to the DWP general manager who pitched it to the commission. Fred Pickle, the ratepayer advocate, said, absolutely, let's do it. We need it quickly. Then they approved it. The company uh, was, you know, it didn't exist till March of, uh, of, uh, of uh, 2017 after the contract was, was awarded. I mean, this is crazy. No one's double checking the math of anybody at DWP. There's, and, and that's partially goes to why is the controller not doing it? Well, his budget's controlled by the city. Why did Nuri Martinez, who's the chair uh, of a committee that oversees in the city council, uh, uh, the DWP, why, she's starting to ask questions now about Aventador Utilities. No one even heard the name. How do you spend $36 million on a no-bid contract to clean up customer service and no one ever heard the name of Paul Paradis or Aventador Utilities? That's just crazy. That's crazy. Have you found a picture of Paul Parody? No picture of Paul Parody. Doesn't exist. Online, in person. Uh, here's a tip for any enterprising reporter. I went to the 1990 uh, New York Law School yearbook. He allegedly graduated from New York Law School in 1990. There's no picture or name for Paul Parody's. Uh, maybe it was a misprint, maybe it's not online, or maybe he never graduated from New York Law School in 1990, just like, uh, you know, he didn't uh, really do much of a no-bid contract out of his oceanfront condo. One final question. Yeah. What is the status of the litigation of the city, or DWP, against Pricewaterhouse? Is that just everybody caught up in their underwear? <laughs> well, Pricewaterhouse is doing a pretty good job of exposing the city's foibles as a defense. This is all coming from PricewaterhouseCooper and, and a very good attorney named uh, Dan Tomash. And if you go to our last press release online, you can read his brief out lay, laying out this whole scheme, the one that the judge says is a prima facie case of fraud. It's detailed. It's under oath. It's, this is not surmise. But fundamentally, because of the corruption in the city attorney's office and DWP, you can bet we're going to get a lot less from PricewaterhouseCooper, if anything. I mean, they, they, you know, they could get this case dismissed. And that is Mike Fuhrer, I think, in his own way, is so defensive because he does not want to give up this litigation against PricewaterhouseCooper. And instead of looking at the DWP and how outrageous this whole issue is, he's looking forward to PricewaterhouseCooper and saying, we, we got to go plow forward with that. And I think both things are true. He's got to find a way to clean up his house or he's got to go. And he's got to find a way by doing that to still isolate what PricewaterhouseCooper probably did wrong, which is a part of the problem. The real problem is DWP is also part of the problem. And no one's acknowledging this is a human customer service problem, a management problem, a leadership problem, and it goes back decades. 
and it's uh, and it's it's frankly on uh, Eric Garcetti's head. I think the reason Eric Garcetti will never be president of the United States is partially because he's got this DWP thing hanging around his neck that when he starts running anywhere and doing anything, all oh, it's going to come out of the closet. He was he was complicit in every one of these decisions, um, and and no one knows who he is anyway, so it's easy not to run for president. <laughs> but if you ever do. You better better not have something like this in your closet, and he's going to have it in his closet unless he starts to get off the, on the ball and do something about it. Okay. Thank you all. Take care. Bye. Good job. Do we need to get one of those?